Proverbs 14, 14. Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. I began uh, last week going over some things uh, concerning backsliding. It, the word backsliding is not even a New Testament word. It's not found anywhere in the New Testament. And uh, the term comes from Proverbs 14 here in Jeremiah chapters 2 and 3. Uh, you need to be careful to notice this because although we use the term practically and devotionally, in reference to a Christian out of fellowship with the Lord, doctrinally, the word backslidden or backslider is not found anywhere in the New Testament. All right? Uh, it might not be found in the New Testament as far as the word, but a lot of Christians practice it pretty frequently. Back, backslider. Uh, backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. This gives us enough righteous calls to take the matter of backsliding and apply it to individuals in some cases. Because Proverbs 14, 14, 14, 14 is certainly aimed at an individual. Because it says the backslider in heart. And when you find the word backsliding <coughs> excuse me, and backslider uh, and backslidings, plural, in Jeremiah chapters 2 and 3, it's always in reference to Israel. It's always in reference to Israel. But in Proverbs 14, 14, it's in reference to an individual human being. Because it says the backslider in the heart shall be filled with his own ways. So it's talking about a person. All right? It's talking about an individual. With this one mention of the backslidden individual in the book of Proverbs 14, you'll find the term applied five times to Israel as a nation. So we're dealing with, you know, uh, basically the word dealing with Israel, although we use that as a, you know, a Christian's backslidden, or we say they're out of fellowship with the Lord or something like that. The reference here is the only time it's used for an individual. And this is uh, in the Old Testament under the law. Now, the word most of the time is used in reference to the nation of Israel that, it's, that has turned its back on God. Uh, in Jeremiah 2.19, thy backsliding shall reprove thee. This is how the term is used mainly in reference to Israel as a nation. It's talking about a nation that's gone back on God and is sliding back like a backsliding heifer. Backsliding Israel in Jeremiah 3, 11. Backsliding uh, Israel in Jeremiah 3, 6. Backsliding Israel in Jeremiah 3, 12. Backsliding children in three, uh, Jeremiah 3, 14. I believe I went over this. So the term backslider is not a New Testament term. The accurate term for a Christian who is in the condition of a backslider is out of fellowship with the Lord. All right? So the position is that of a Christian whose heart has gone back uh, on God, but of course is still saved. You can never be unsaved, all right, once you're saved. Uh, you can't be born again, again, again and again. All right? Uh, there's nothing in the Bible about being saved more than once or repetition of regeneration can't get saved and lose it and get saved again and lose it and get saved again. Nothing about that. We believe in rededicating. A Christian ought to rededicate their life to God. But you can't be unborn. Uh, okay, went over this, went over that. A Christian who is out of fellowship with God has a problem in the heart. Alright, it goes straight, it goes straight to the heart. Whenever a Christian is out of fellowship with the Lord, out of fellowship with God, there's a problem in the heart. That Christian has a controversy with God about something that God wants them to do. And they don't want to do it. They just ain't going to do it. Uh, several verses in the Bible are aimed at Christians to warn them about this condition. For example, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. 
Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now the Lord's able to keep us from falling if we want to be kept from falling. When you speak about these things, the unsaved people who are trying to get to heaven by good works, they think that you're talking about falling from grace. All right? So we got unsaved preachers in America and uh, saved preachers who are, don't know the Bible that well. They go to Galatians 5, 4. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen, by, fallen from grace. They say, see there, you're fallen from grace. You've lost your salvation. Paul, when he writes Galatians, Paul realized when he wrote these churches that there are probably some unsaved people in churches. Do you think that every person in every single church in America is saved, born again? No. They're not. So, uh, they're, they're, the person that's counting on the law, law to justify them has fallen from grace. When that's what he says that in context. Who's, who's serving you? Or, or, who's serving you? You're basically counting on the law. Uh, you're fallen from grace. You're, you think you're justified by the law. See, that's why Romans was written. Romans was written to teach that a person is saved by grace through faith, without works. Galatians was written to teach that a person is kept saved by grace through faith. And that's why the people believe you can lose your salvation carefully avoid Romans and Galatians. Except they go to one verse in each book because they got the word baptized is in each book one time. And it's not even talking about water baptism. It's talking about spirit baptism. Romans 6.3 and Galatians 3.27. That's the only time they go to them books is to lift that verse out of the context and teach a doctrine that damns souls to hell. Uh, okay, whatever that, whatever that. When the Bible speaks about falling in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it's talking about the fact that even though the Christian is saved, born again, headed home for heaven, part of Christ that he can fall into sin. He can fall into trouble. And if that isn't enough, Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falls seven times and rises up again. There's a great deal of difference between falling in the aisle of an airplane at 32,000 feet and falling out the door of that airplane. You understand what I'm saying? Falling in the aisle of the airplane is one thing. But falling out of the door of that airplane at 32,000 feet, that's a whole different thing. When, when people try to damn people's souls by teaching water salvation or good works, they think that what happens is when you're in Christ, somebody opens the door and you get kicked out of Christ and you drop 32,000 feet into hell. No, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. All right? Uh, when, the, when the Christian falls in Christ, he is in Christ when he falls, and he is in Christ when he gets back up. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Paul said, Romans 8, 38, 39. Eternal security is a wonderful doctrine. Now, people believe, people say, well, you, you're teaching that once saved, always saved. You're teaching that people can go out and live like the devil. I've never preached that one time in my life, that now that you're saved, you can just live like the devil. And everything will be all right. Everything won't be all right. All right? God will take you out to the woodshed and give you a good spanking. What is a backslider, practically speaking? Well, backsliding is turning away from God. In 1 Kings 11, 9, we read, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God. Turned from the Lord God. When a Christian gets out of fellowship with God, they grow cold. They're cold. And they leave their first love. Yeah. Alright, that's what that church in Revelation 2, 4. It's, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left, not lost, left thy first love. Getting out of fellowship with God as a saved person is turning from the simplicity of the gospel to salvation by some other way. Alright? Some define backsliding as one sin that separates the believer from the Lord. And of course, that's not true. Alright? Speaking, speaking uh, scripturally, the term backsliding is growing cold and losing interest in the things of God. 
you got millions of people like that in America. Uh, there was a time in their life that got saved, but something happened in their life. I mean, it's some tribulation, trial, persecution, sin, whatever it is, something happened, and uh, their wife left them, their husband left them, their kids have gotten a mess, they, they just got bitter at God, they, they're out. And once they're out, when they, if, they, if they stay out, for a long period of time, from what I've heard, I've, by the grace of God, I thank God I've never experienced it. But from what I hear, the longer you're out, the harder it is to get back in. Because yep. that old flesh just gets used to being out. Yep. Uh, so they lose interest in the Lord, they lose interest in the Bible, they lose interest in prayer, they lose interest in going to church. Fellowshipping with the saints of God, they cease to witness, and uh, they turn a lot of times to the world for help. So, you say, how many people in America do you think are like that? I don't know. I don't know what percentage. I'm not God. I know a lot of Christians that used to be in church, used to be in fellowship with God, that... You can't find them with the FBI, the CIA, a magnifying glass, the SWAT team, the KGB, and the ATF, and the state troopers. You can find them at Walmart. You can find them at the yard sales, the garage sales. You can find them all over the place. But not in church. Uh, one of the reasons, don't get mad, but one of the reasons you can't have fellowship with the average professing Christian in America is you have to backslide to be in fellowship with them. Yeah. 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 Amen! The reason you can't have fellowship with the average professing Christian in America is you have to backslide to get in fellowship with him. Most Christians, not all, but a lot of Christians at least, they don't witness. And when they do, they got these charismatics, they talk about the gifts of the Spirit. You got the Holy Ghost, you talk in tongues, you get slain in the Spirit. They talk about a bunch of junk. And uh, they witness about the gifts and who's more spiritual. And most of them people are very carnal if they're saved. Yeah. And uh, instead of people going to hell, the main reason why Jesus died is not to give you a bunch of gifts. The main reason why Jesus died is to keep you out of hell. Amen. You know why I got saved? Like, don't, you're going to flip out on this one. I didn't really get saved so much as to go to heaven. I mean, I'm going to heaven. I thank God for heaven. I got saved because I didn't want to die and burn in hell forever. Amen. Yeah. That's the reason why I got saved. Yeah. I didn't want to burn in hell forever. And therefore, I got saved, so I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven, thank God. But I'm saying the main number one reason that I got saved was not, I want to go to heaven. Now, I'm going to heaven because I'm not going to hell. But the main primary number one reason is I don't want to burn in hell forever. Mm -hmm. Hey, I burned the tip of my finger before. Woo! You want to put it in water. Soothe it. That's what a nurse told me one time. She said, if you burn, she said, get water on it as quick as possible. But there's, there's none of this in hell. Yeah. Man, in Luke 16, one, one, one drop of water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Amen. But there's no water in hell. There's no babies in hell. There's no flowers in hell. It's just burning flame and torment, sorrow, pain, grief, the man in Luke 16 called it come to this place of torment. They never get out. I've said it a million times. I'll say it again. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached a message, the hell of hell. He said the hell of hell is not, he said the fact that it's painful and they're in sorrow, they're screaming out and crying, they're in pain and torment and everything else, that's bad enough. 
But he said the hell of hell is that it lasts forever. <coughs> you can't even grasp eternity in your mind. Because you and I are finite. We are finite human beings. We have finite minds. God's an infinite God. When did God begin? He always has been. Now you can't even grab a hold of that. Your brain, neither can I. We can't even hardly grab you know, 30 or 50 or 60 years, 70 years, let alone eternity. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Yeah. Revelation 1.8. Yeah. You know what he told those Pharisees? Man, they got madder and a hornet at him. You know what he told those Pharisees? They were bragging about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their forefathers there in John chapter 8. And Jesus said in John 8, 58, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know what he was saying? When he was here on this earth 2,000 years ago, he's saying the same God back in Genesis 1 that created all that stuff, that was the same God that showed up on this earth 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Right. We ought to shout and run the aisles. Yeah. Uh, A lot of people don't have courage to tell unsaved people that they're, if they don't get saved, then they're going to go to hell. You don't have to be mean about it. You don't have to be rude about it. You don't have to be wacko about it. You just say you need to get saved. You don't want to go to hell, friend. You want to go to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. Give them a gospel track. <clears throat> All right? Some Christians are afraid if they condemn the world, the world will condemn them. Backsliding is a gradual process, usually. It don't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it, it does. Usually, it happens uh, like this. Uh, you start missing. And I know there's times people have to work and things like. That. I know things come up and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. But uh, you start missing Wednesday night. You know, there's churches in this area that don't have Wednesday night service. Yeah. Bunches of them, honey. Nationwide, there's a ton of them. Question, why do you think they don't have Wednesday night service? Because people don't show up. A lot of churches in the last 20 years have done away with Sunday night service. I can't tell you. I preach around the country. I drive all over the place. I can't tell you and fly all over the place, but I can't tell you the number of churches that I've seen in the United States of America in just in the last 20, 25 years. they got this big, beautiful building, this big, beautiful church. With my wife and I went by a church the other day. I forget which one it was. I said, look at this church, Tony. Look at this big, beautiful church. And sign up front said, Sunday, 10.30 a.m. This big, beautiful wonderful looking building has church service once a week at 10.30 a.m. That's probably only an hour. They sing a song or two. Somebody sings a special song. Give a couple announcements. And preacher, the preacher gets up and preaches a little 25 minute sermonette. They shake hands and say goodbye. See you next Sunday morning at 10.30. That's why our country's in the condition that Amen. it's in. Yeah. And the average Christian says, I don't care. Cobble, I don't care what you say. I don't care. I'm not changing my way of life. I'm not changing. I'm not, I don't care. God can bring... Hiroshima bombs down upon us, our whole country. He can bomb us. He can blow my brains out. I can care less. I'm going to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. And God says, okay. Okay. I'll allow Joe Biden to become president. I might even allow her to become president. Yeah. If you don't get right with God, America. Because yeah. she gets in, it's over, honey. Amen. Yeah. 
You say, oh, you're, you're a preacher? You're talking politics? Oh, I talk it all the time. Uh, I don't want my country to go to hell. Yeah. Pray for kings and for those in authority, 1 Timothy 2. Righteousness is all of the nation, sins are approached to any people. Him and her and him, her running mate, are the two wackiest, far left wing people that we've ever had running for president. Amen. That's the truth. <laughs> and if, there, if they were Republicans, I would say the same thing about them. I, I don't give two flips if you've got an R or a D beside, behind or an I after your name. I, I vote for the people that I think are going to run this country the best. Amen. All I can tell you is, I don't agree everything with Donald Trump, but I'm going to tell you one thing. When the last few months there, when he was in office, I had a Dodge Ram truck that I had to fill up with gas, and the gas was $1.87 a gallon. Amen. Go ahead and get mad. After he got in, last three and a half years, it went to four and five bucks a gallon. I was out in California shortly thereafter, and it was six, seven, eight dollars a gallon out there. I seen it with my own eyeballs. It's still five and six dollars a gallon out there in California. Everything's outrageous out there. And their wacko governor is going to give the illegal immigrants up to $150,000 to buy a house. Look in his eyes sometimes when they're interviewing him and Gavin Newsom and tell me that he ain't chuck full of demons right out of pits of hell. Yeah. Along with Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. The average Christian says, Oh, I don't believe you should talk like that. Oh, oh. That's why we're being judged by God because the Christians are half whacked out. Yeah. Bunch of little wimps. Backsliding for a person or a country is a gradual process. You start missing Wednesday night, you start missing Sunday night. For long, you're a good little Roman Catholic. You go to Mass on Sunday morning. <coughs> it doesn't happen suddenly. You may be shocked later by the sudden outward manifestation of terrible sin, but as Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said many years ago, at the bottom of every tragedy in human character is a long process of wicked thinking. At the bottom of every tragedy in human character is a long process of wicked thinking. Many little things have entered in and undermined the, law, the lifelong undermine the life long before it comes to a shocking tragedy. The story of Lot's backsliding illustrates this point. Now you know what 2 Peter chapter 2 calls Lot? A just and a righteous man. If you read Genesis 19, you wouldn't think he was too just and righteous. The last you hear of Lot, he's committing incest with one daughter one night and the other daughter the next night. And he's drunk. And from those two physical relationships with his two daughters come two little boys. Come the Ammonites and the Moabites who have been enemies of Israel for thousands of years. Yep. And that, what I just said, is the truth, yep. the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yep. First of all, uh, cut Lot's seven uh, downward steps. Number one is uh, covetousness. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain. Genesis 13, 10. The eyes are the first to leave the Savior. The eyes and the heart. But the eyes and the heart are the first to leave the Savior. This is what got Eve in trouble. This is what got David in trouble. When Achan got in trouble, he said, I saw, I coveted, and I took. Joshua 7, 21. I saw, sin usually begins with a look. Sin usually begins with a look. David saw a woman. 2 Samuel 11, 2. Joshua 7, 21. Achan said, when I saw, 
Babylonian garments there. I coveted them. I took them. You know what it resulted in? Him and his family's death. They got stoned to death. Uh, mine eye, Lamentations 351, mine eye affecteth mine heart. You know what the Bible says about Lot? The Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with her unlawful deeds in seeing and hearing. These two right here, these two right here. What he saw and what he heard, he was around a bunch of sodomites. He said day, they said day by day, uh, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds there at Sodom and Gomorrah. Call him a righteous man. But he dwelled among the wrong people. Be careful who you dwell around. Yeah. Be careful who you hang around with. Amen. Yeah. If they don't love God, love church, love the Bible, love preaching and teaching, yeah. get away. Sometimes you got to be around people you work with and people, your family members and some family things you got to go to, and you know, stuff like that. But I mean, I wouldn't make it a habit to hang around people every day, every week that don't love God. If you don't have to. If you don't have to. All right? Uh, covetousness. Uh, second thing is choice. Lot made too low of a choice. Uh, I'll go over these more next week because I only got a minute to go for this first message here. Covetousness. Choice, compromise, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. I'll go over a little bit more on these things next time. Uh, number four, capture. Lot was captured by the enemy in Genesis 14, verse 11 and 12. If one lives too near sin, you'll be captured. Be taken captive by the devil. I'll go into that more next time. Uh, and then... Uh, Number five, carnal. He sat in the gate of Sodom. Sat in the gate of Sodom. He was a, a member of uh, the committee there in the town there, a big shot. He gained worldly influence by total involvement with the ecological environmental control. And he lost all the power he ever had with God. Carnal. Number six, crippled. Lot got weak. He got weak. We'll go over that. And number seven, we find a cave. He winds up drunk in a cave. That's a lot. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 calls him a, a righteous and a just man. Now, I want to bring a message. I want you to turn to Matthew 14. <clears throat> 